Craving the perfect holiday snack? Check out Farmer Bill's Biltonk. Think beef jerky, but better. No sugar, no preservatives, just pure animal protein goodness. Crafted from premium grass-fed beef or bison and air-dried to perfection, Farmer Bill's Biltong is nutrient-packed, energy-dense, and perfect for an on-the-go treat or a standout snack for your next party. My favorite is the original bison, but the other flavors like the original beef, smokehouse, and spicy chili have me second-guessing that choice more than once. Visit FarmerBillsProvisions.com to grab a one-pound slab or a variety pack and use code BIZBIT10 for 10% off. Farmer Bills Biltong, don't be the two-liter guy at this year's Christmas party. This girl, Ainsley Costello, joined in July, and I, I met her and her family at Bitcoin Park. And I was just like, you know, just give it a shot. You don't have to you don't have to take anything off Spotify. You know, just like throw a track up there. Like, maybe who knows, maybe in a week you'll have 10 bucks. And she's still today our biggest artist that we've ever had on there. She's the first artist to get over a million sats. I think she's up to, she, I think she's earned just over 700 bucks in the last couple months. And a really cool metric there to compare that against is that in five years on 65 platforms, she's made $750 total. Welcome to the Business Bitcoinization Show, the show dedicated to helping you enrich your life and grow your business with Bitcoin, the hardest money on planet Earth. I'm your host, Josh Friedemann, and our guest today is Sam Means, who's the co-founder of Wavelake, which is a value-for-value value app that helps listeners discover new artists and directly support their favorite artists with micropayments of Bitcoin. The only catch is that these artists need to put their music on Wavelake. So if you have an artist you would love to directly support, you can let them know about Wavelake if it seems like a good fit after listening to today's episode. Now, I want to give you a quick update about this podcast. I've recently started live streaming shows on YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn. They are just going to be live streamed as I record the interviews and then later released on the podcast. So if you're interested in catching episodes before they're released on the podcast, feel free to subscribe on YouTube or just follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn, and you'll likely be able to see at least some of the episodes as they're recorded in real time. Thanks to those who have been supporting the show on Fountain in the last week. Those who have been streaming sats as they listen include a few anonymous people, including users 765-30774-1495-536 and 738-26533. You know who you are, even though we don't. Thank you also to Farscapian and JoeW24. Also, Piez and Hashing to Heating sent boosts along with messages. Piez said... The signal's strong. This is the way. And this is in reference to the Anchor Watch episode from last week. Also, Hashing to Heating about the same episode said, keep on keeping on and keep up the good stuff in two separate booths. Thanks again to all who have been supporting the show on Fountain. If you want to support the show, listen on the Fountain app. You can either stream stats as you listen or send a boost. Now, this week's Bitcoin meetup spotlight is the Central PA Bitcoiners. The Central PA Bitcoiners meetup gets together about once a month in the Harrisburg region of Pennsylvania and maintains very active Telegram channel for Bitcoiners interested in self-sovereignty and homesteading. Their most recent event was a screening of the Bitcoin-focused movie Stranded at the Simpson Library in Mechanicsburg. If you want to find out more about the Central PA Bitcoiners, you can find them on Meetup or on Twitter at CPA Bitcoiner. Those links are down in the show notes below, along with a link to the Oshi app, which you can use to find a Bitcoin meetup near you. Now, we're going to get to our interview with Sam right after this. Business owners, unlock the benefits Bitcoin has to offer your business with the Bitcoin for Business Quick Start Guide. This 27-page guide highlights the six ways you can grow your business with Bitcoin. Check it out in the show notes. Sam, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So I like to start off every single interview with a few questions that help us to get to know you a little bit better and give us some insight for our own lives. You ready for these? I'm ready. When and how did you first learn about Bitcoin? Uh, I learned about it through a friend of mine, I'd say 2013 or so. He was living in New York and and started getting into it. I think probably it was like a connection to like probably the gold stuff that was happening around there. It was like post-2008. A lot of people were looking for safe havens for you know money and real estate was kind of shot and everything was weird. So a lot of people were going towards gold. Max Kaiser was really 
pretty vocal around then. And um, I think through that, a friend of mine just sort of discovered Bitcoin and I'd heard about it a little bit. But, uh, you know, by around 2013 or so, my friend um, ended up having like, I think it was the second, the first or the second Bitcoin ATM in New York. Um, Mm. And he just was like on fire about it, talking about it and trying to get everybody on board with it. Um, And I didn't, I didn't get on board with it then, but uh, I I run an e-commerce store. I work with, I work with musicians and about a year later, uh, the platform that I use Shopify started, they enabled it through like BitPay or whatever it was at the time. And I was just like, whatever, I'll just turn it on and see how it goes. And then kind of set it and forgot about it until probably 2017. (laughs) Um, when everybody started, anybody that was paying attention started paying more attention, I guess, because that's when everything started getting kind of silly and uh, the, the, the second huge wave of all coins came in and all that stuff and the rise to 20 grand and, and everything that happened in that cycle and the, the block size wars and all that stuff. So I started getting really involved, um, then, but just sort of on like a, a cheerleader level, I didn't really know what to do or <laughs> just like, this is cool. I, I think this is the future, but I just also have no idea how it works. So I'm just going to dive a little bit deeper into the fundamentals of everything. So I did that for you know, a while, a number of years, um, went to some conferences and meetups and stuff and, uh, just spent a lot of time learning about it. Then got super excited about lightning mm-hmm. and that, uh, you know, that came around 2018. I started looking into that. I, I set up a node. I didn't even know what that meant, but I just figured out how to kind of how to do it. Um, and then, yeah, like 2021, I would say that's when everything, the, the lightning network started really getting solidified. And, um, I was thinking a lot about how it, that, would benefit really uh, greatly in e-commerce, obviously because of the the cheap transactions, the fast transactions, global transactions. Um, and also really started clicking for me when I saw the podcast 2.0 stuff pop up that this could be connected to the music industry. So I spent the next couple of years after that, just basically being a super annoying on Twitter, trying to get people, <laughs> trying to find people to um, help me make something <laughs> in music. I started a thing called the lightning store, really just mm-hmm. to get attention. And I was just making like band shirts, you know, like band crossover, like Bitcoin band shirts and trying to f- identify the people in the space that were into music and it worked. So, uh, yeah, fast forward to, to last year, got hooked up with, with Michael who had started sort of working on a very early version of wave Lake, And then at the beginning of this year, we, we kind of rebranded it and relaunched it as a, as a real viable product that's doing great today. And we'll delve into that more in the rest of the interview. But the question that I have for you right now, question number two, is what's an insight or fact about Bitcoin that you wish everyone understood? This is a t- I mean, I think about this one a lot because as I'm we're trying to kind of onboard what I typically refer to as, as normies, but I feel like I have to find a better a better word for that. It's not sure. very inviting. Um, but uh, I mean, I think it's just understanding that it's more than just a there's more to it than just financial gain. You know, that's what a lot of people have heard about, about it. They don't really understand the technology involved in it. They don't understand the, they're not thinking bigger picture, how this could work as an equitable, uh, equitable as it's just like a global, fully equitable balanced money that works for the people instead of for, um, the people that are currently running all of our, our money and everything right now. So I would say that definitely the environmental aspect, I think is a tough one, a tough hurdle when kind of trying to bring in a lot of people and just in conversations that comes up a lot and they don't really understand how uh, that whole thing works. So I would say those are probably the two biggest hurdles for me, especially trying to, trying to um, present this as an idea to, to change a specific industry. You know, mm-hmm. like it's, it's really interesting that it's just, this is starting to make its way into other industries outside of financial industry. So I guess getting over a lot of that, jumping over these hoops and these different narratives that have come up over the years can be difficult. So question number three, and it may be something that's in response to these narratives. It may be something else entirely, but question number three is what's the Bitcoin resource you most recommend to other people? It's really just, it's the, for me, it was the community. So, you know, it's like, I, I have learned the most just by, just by talking to people. There's mm-hmm. so much information out there and it could be so intimidating. So, you know, it started out, I guess, just being like Twitter. Um, but Twitter is not really much of a resource anymore. Um, 
Now I would say something like Noster, if, which is another, which is a whole other thing to have to explain to somebody. Sure. Um, but, but it's, it's pretty easy and everyone there is really welcoming. And, and I always say it's the best place to ask stupid questions. Like I've never been afraid to ask stupid questions. I'm mm-hmm. the first person to say like, Hey, I don't know how this works. Can somebody try to explain this to me? Um, so yeah, I mean, just find somebody who's willing to be patient with you. And typically that's almost anybody, you know, on, um, on Nostra at this stage. I mean, that's like an incredibly inviting community of people who are just looking to see things happen. So, um, you know, look into the Domus app and just maybe sign up there and post, I'm new here. I'm interested in this. And odds are within a few minutes, you'll probably have a whole horde of people trying to help you understand how things work. So question number four is beyond a Bitcoin, what's a resource tool or idea that's been helpful to you or your business recently? Well, so I'm not, I would never have really considered myself a typical entrepreneur. You know, that's not really my, my jam, I guess. I'm a musician, creative person at heart. So I just kind of fell into owning businesses in my quest to kind of hmm. want to make things better, you know? Um, and I'd say I fought a lot. I fought a long time for against like reading business books or looking into, um, you know, maybe traditional management thing, you know, just things that are just kind of like typical, stereotypical, cheesy, cheesy business things. Um, and over, over the the course of, you know, I guess now like almost 16, 17 years that I've been running businesses, uh, I don't know. I feel like a lot of that's as I'm, as I've gotten older and sort of thought like, well, maybe I should go back and look at these things and see if there's anything I've, I've missed. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of don't recommend any of that stuff because when I, I I feel like a lot of people get hung up on these little things of like what you should do and how, like, and, and that sort of is parallel with, you know, a lot of things that, that you see in Bitcoin or or these other things that people just get hung up. And I think a lot of the reasons why the world just kind of stays the way it is is because so many people tend to just look towards these um, instructions on how things are supposed to be. And I'm realizing, I've realized now as, as I'm getting older and doing this, it's like, it's actually been very fun to be creative and learn and mess up and do all these things. Um, So I would say just, I would say, you know, I, I could give some boring answer of some like software that I use, but sure. I would say the best tool has just been, has just been being like kind of recklessly <laughs> fumbling my way through, through the last 15 years. Um, cause I, I know like the things when I've made mistakes, I've really learned from them. And mm-hmm. I, and when I've created systems and processes to avoid that, they've been mine. So they've been very, uh, I don't know. They just tend to stick, you know, rather than like, well, I don't know how this works. Maybe I should read a book and it'll tell me and I'll, I'll, I'll be able to absorb 20% of that. And, you know, it just ends up being a, ni- a nightmare and you end up focusing way too much on what you think you're supposed to be doing instead of just solving the problem. So yeah. I don't know, maybe that's my long winded answer. I don't know if that made any sense. Yeah, no, actually I think it's super valuable and just staying open to opportunities, moving forward, figuring things out as you go and recognizing that you're not going to necessarily find the answer in a book. And if you do, it doesn't matter if you're not putting stuff into action. So like following someone's um, blueprint probably won't be exactly what you need for your business. And so there's probably things you're going to pick up along the way. Yeah, everything's so different. There's so many variables, you know, with everything. It's it's so tough to try to conform to a particular idea when you have so many different things happening, firing at you from all angles every single day as a business owner. Now we have our final, what we call our arbitrary but insightful question, and it's this. As a general life principle, is it better to ask why or why not? Why not? What's your thinking there? (laughs) Better to ask why or why not? Yeah. I guess it just goes back to the, like the rebellious thing, you know, like I I, actually, I was, I was, here's a good example. I was five minutes late to this, to this podcast. I, uh, I bought this old building in downtown Phoenix. It's like, it's almost a hundred years old. And, um, I'm working with the city to try to restore some of the the cool elements that are, that we know are there, like unearth some stuff. And there's a dude downstairs, um, who's a professional and has been soda blasting, brick buildings probably his entire life. And, and we, he was doing that. And I started to see some of this sign that he had told me wasn't there. I started to actually be able to see it mm. underneath 
where he was, where he was working. And I had to stop him. And I was like, Hey, um, you told me this wasn't here, but here it is. And he's like, well, I can't do this. And instead of saying why I said, why not? <laughs> like, there has to be some way it's like, if you're, you know, you're going to have to explain to me why you can't do this. Um, because when you told me what I, what basically like most people, when you're working in any kind of business exchange are going to try to be leading you mm. toward the thing that they want to do yeah. very infrequently. Are they leading you towards the thing that you actually want? Mm. Because most people are just either are lazy or scared or they don't know what most people just don't even know what they're doing half the time anyway. And so they want to guide the, they want to guide things to be down, you know, to go down their comfort zone. Um, so who knows? I mean, this guy might be right. Maybe he's right. Maybe there is no way to save this sign, but maybe he also just wants to get done today. So he's like, I can't do it. And I'm going to, so I'm just going to keep going. I, this is, I only have this, this, uh, lift for one day. And so I'm just want to get it done. And that, that was my agenda for the day. Yep. But maybe he's wrong. And maybe, maybe that sign that was just almost removed and disappeared from history will get saved because I asked him why not, you know, and, and now he's stopping. I was like, just stop. I have to go do a podcast. I'll be back. Mm. Don't do anything else. <laughs> You're leaving us with a cliffhanger here. Uh, I appreciate you uh, coming to yeah, the part, interview. Part two will, <laughs> will show the restoration of the sign. Meet Linkster, your premier Bitcoin-focused advisor. Linkster caters to businesses, institutions, family offices, and high net worth individuals. They merge your unique financial goals and needs with Linkster's Bitcoin expertise to craft your own sustainable plan to preserve and grow the value of your hard-earned profits and retained earnings. At Linkster, it's not just advice, it's tailored execution. Connect directly with the founder by visiting Linkster.com. That's L-Y-N-C-S-T-E-R. Dot com Linkster. Secure your future with Bitcoin. Today's episode of Business Bitcoinization is proudly brought to you by Vellus Commerce, where the future of business technology meets Bitcoin. As we journey through the era of Bitcoin and its transformational impact on businesses, there's one name that stands out. Vellus Commerce. Whether you're looking to build a cutting edge website, a seamless mobile app, or custom software, Vellus is your go to team. They've been diving deep into the world of Bitcoin since 2014, making them one of the most experienced groups for integrating Bitcoin and Lightning payments into a variety of digital platforms. But here's what truly sets them apart Vellus Commerce doesn't just build, they bring a wealth of knowledge to ensure your project's success from day one. Their team understands the nuances of Bitcoin, ensuring that your business stays ahead of the curve. And for all business Bitcoinization listeners out there, Vellus Commerce is offering a free consultation to kickstart your project the right way. So if you're ready to future proof your business in the coming age of hyper Bitcoinization, head over to VellusCommerce.com or reach out on Twitter at Vellus Commerce. Let's make Make sure your business thrives in the Bitcoin era. So I appreciate that explanation. Uh, very cool story there. I hope everything ends up well. Today, we're going to be talking about Wave Lake. And um, I think it was before the interview started, but just like the the amount of quality uh, on Wave Lake continues to increase, not to say anything about the the early tracks or anything like that. It's just a hop on. There's new stuff. It, it's, it's cool to hear. Um, but that's from someone who listens to Wave Lake some. Most people may not know about this. So if you could just share about Wave Lake, you've kind of hinted at it already. What is it and kind of what's the value, especially for musicians? Yeah, so the very simple version of this, like the elevator pitch, is it's just it's an open music library. It's all published on RSS. So if you know how podcasting works, it's very similar. Um, the main difference here is that you're able to pay if, if, if you if you like what you hear and and you have a wallet, you know how this stuff works, or someone maybe has onboarded you and, and told you how it works. You can through various clients because it's all open. It's an open, open distributed library. If you're listening to music on fountain through a podcast, then you, and you think this song is really cool. You can pay as you, as you consume that, that content, that music, you can boost it. Um, if you find it on, on something like Noster through on a note, it's all, all the stuff is also being distributed on a relay. So you can, you can zap it. If you just go to wavelake.com and you, you, you know, you start discovering some new music there, you can, you can do all those things there as well. Um, it's simply really, it's, it's just, if you've heard of value mm -hmm. for value, I don't know if you've had many conversations about value for value on this show, but it's essentially just value for value music. You know, we, when I saw that happening in podcasting, it was an instant no brainer for me. It's like this, this, connects the dots for all the things that when I was coming up in music, 
made a lot of sense to me as, as to where the future was going. I, I, I mentioned this often because it was one that had the most, um, had the biggest impact on me at the time. This was like maybe 2005 or something. Somebody wrote an article called Music Like Water. And this was pre, before streaming services mm-hmm. existed, but they were, it was, in, it was in the air, you know, like there was file sharing was happening and stuff. And the point of the article, I forget who wrote it. I should probably go find it some, one of these days, but um, it was basically just like in the future, you'll consume music and media and entertainment, much like you do water or any, any, any utility. And it sort of, there's a lot of, put, I remember there being pushed back and having conversations about that article. People were like, how could you devalue music and have it be too, you know, you know, kind of put it in a box that it's, this is just like a utility or something that, that is, that has no value because everyone's used to seeing like a, a, a tangible physical item and, and there's a $15 value on it or a $20 value and you buy that thing and now it's yours and you own it. So this idea of, of paying as you consumed seemed a little, a little cheap, you know, maybe at the time, but then fast forward, you know, 10, 15 years and you have streaming services and we all know how that went down. And we all know how that the the value of what you're consuming um, is a generally locked behind a paywall. And then as you're consuming that information, you are paying, you are giving some value back to the artist, but it's very, very, very small. So this is just really bridging that gap between those two ideas and enabling people to be able to provide as much value as they want to an artist, as opposed to just being locked behind a paywall and only being able to give someone a fraction of a penny every single time they listen to something. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, uh, your opinion as a musician, you know, I've I've heard people talk in the past about how, I guess, bemoaning the fact that music is so easily available when it comes to streaming. You've just kind of talked about that conversation that's happening in the past. Did you feel that way? Or were you always interested in the streaming side? Because the other the other argument is people just view it as a commodity. They don't value it as much for the artistic side, you know, lower audio quality, perhaps people just listen to it in the background as opposed to it being something they sit down and enjoy. What are your thoughts there as a musician? I didn't have a lot of context back then because you have to sort of understand how things were. They're like m- most music discovery was coming from radio and TV and movies and stuff still, you know, so that's very, that, that was all kind of being, or, or like even music sites and reviews were still a thing, but it, it had, it had morphed into something that was very much like big business, you know, like people, if people were getting reviews in a major publication, it was a, there was some handshake happened to make that happen. You know, it wasn't, it, this was, this isn't, isn't an or- organic process anymore by 2005 or 2006. Um, and, you know, I, I wasn't super thrilled as a musician about the file sharing thing, but as a, as a music fan, I actually was, I discovered a ton of new music through file sharing because that was the, you know, think of like a CD or a music, a record store was kind of the paywall of that era. <laughs> you know, it's like sort of, that is sort of the Spotify. And even at that time, like CDs, CDs by that point were I don't know, 17, 18, 19 bucks or something like they started off really expensive and then they got cheap. And then as the music industry started to lose grasp of the financial elements of the, of their business because of file sharing, they started cranking those prices back up again and it just wasn't economical. And that's what's happening right now. It's like, it's not a scale. It's the same thing. We keep going through these, these cycles of like, there's some innovation that gets pushed back by the industry. The industry is eventually forced to adapt to it they commandeered in some way, you know, there's many with, this could be a much longer podcast. If we went into all <laughs> intricacies there in the music industry and where they get their stranglehold, but we're finding ourselves in the exact same situation now where we have a bajillion, uh, potential ways. All, all these streaming sites have become content creators themselves because they have to have some way to differentiate their platform from the other platforms so that you will give them the $14 or mm-hmm. whatever. Um, and that's happening with music, you know, at first it was really cool. It's like, Oh, all these things are starting to sprout up, but then Spotify is like, well, why would anybody use Spotify over, over iTunes? It, and it didn't become about the quality of the product. That's what should have happened. Spotify has changed very little in the last, you know, in the last 15 years. Um, what it became about was the content and what's there, what they're able to, um, to lock into their things. That's why they're focusing on podcasts and audiobooks and exclusive things, you know, where it's like, you would use Spotcat, you'd use Spotify because Spotify has this specific thing, or you would use Apple Music because you can bundle it 
with all of your other Apple services, you know, in one, in one swoop. And the more that stuff sort of gets bundled and, and switched around, obviously the person who ends up getting screwed the most is the people who are providing all the Mm -hmm. content for those, for those platforms. So, um, I'm just sick of that. You know, it's like, it has to stop at some point in time. Um, what's going to happen here is we hope that, you know, we're building wave Lake. It's a, it's basically just a distribution platform. We're also building players and other things to sort of present the idea of how, you know, what else could be, what else can exist. Um, like we're building an iOS player right now. It's all open source. And we're hoping there's 10 versions mm-hmm. of this because we don't care. You know, we want to see people actually curate music. Like I, I hope that there's a player that's just playing like, you know, indie rock and that they're curating a very specific community of like, Hey, if you really like this kind of music, you really like the taste of this community, you're going to use this app. If you just kind of like everything and you just want to want a radio, maybe you use wave, like, you know, that maybe that's what happens down the road. But, um, I think just incentivizing, uh, music curation, music discovery, development, um, progress, getting out of this, this idea that like everything has to be locked behind a paywall. Um, I think it's super important moving forward in the future because none of this stuff is sustainable. We all yeah, know that. Yeah. Well, certainly, uh, given the fact that streaming services exist, Wavelike and others like it potentially in the future are, are extremely valuable to the musicians. I'm guessing that the growth of Wavelike is kind of like a step one. And correct, I, I want to get your input here, your insight, your experience. But it seems like step one is getting musicians on the platform, providing content. But then step two is actually getting people outside of the musician and their maybe immediate family and friends listening to it. It's not quite that stark, but sort of is that is that how you see it, or am I kind of looking at the growth of a music player uh, incorrectly? Yeah, we're going we're going slow, almost to a fault, mm-hmm. I think for for some people. You know, we've gotten some pushback at like, hey, you released this feature, but this but it wasn't as fully functional mm-hmm. as we thought it might be, or or as it could be. Um, and that's just because, yeah, we're building we're we're playing the slow game here. Um, we want to make sure first and form, foremost that as people are coming on. You know, we're getting people that are just curious about how this works now. We're not pushing this out to the mainstream at the moment. So we're just getting people that are like, hey, what is this? I sort of know a little bit about this. Um, it seems interesting. I like this idea. I, maybe I heard about it on a podcast or something. We help them get on. And then that experience, you know, for them, they feel like I'm sort of in uncharted territory. They're a lot more forgiving. <laughs> um, and, and also most importantly, very helpful for us. So we, we've, we've learned so much. There's 400 artists on wave Lake today, uh, just over, I think now as of today. And I mean, I can't even tell you how much we've learned and how many things we've sort of, we had priorities that we were working on. But then as these artists started rolling in and having questions and having, and having, um, not complications, but just like, Hey, I'm going to be uploading this track in a couple months. It has a co-writer. I'm going to need all this. Am I going to be able to use wave Lake? And then we're being able to take that feedback and that question and say, yes, actually, I think we could provide that for you. So we're sort of building features in real time for the audience that exists now. Once we have that really super strong fundamental, you know, like core base, um, then we'll start really pushing, you know, hopefully next year, maybe, maybe it takes two years. I don't know, but we, we don't really want to push out until it's really easy to get people on, on board artists and on board their fans. And then also off board them because a lot of people might be interested in the idea and they like the exchange, but they want to pay their rent and maybe they can't pay their rent with sats right now. So they're going to want to have, they're going to have to have a really easy offboarding a way to offboard that cash too, you know, so into cash. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff to think about, but yeah, we're just building really slowly and, and wanting to make sure we're taking all that stuff into consideration, not try to rush it. So I mentioned to you before we started recording as well that I have a brother-in-law with a handful of albums. He's not a Bitcoiner, um, definitely not opposed to it, um, but it's one of those things that for someone like that, if they buy into it and they already have a few albums, it seems like that would be easy to kind of get onto the platform. I'm assuming that's the case, but maybe first of all, Two questions, I guess. First of all, if there's a musician listening to this who has music they've already created, is that an easy way to hop on the platform? Like, is that a pretty easy process? Second of all, what have you been doing or have you been approaching courting musicians to join? Yeah, so no, we we really haven't. It's it's the someone like your brother in law is is perfect for Wave Lake right now. It's like the 
the ideal user for Wavelake at the moment is somebody who's just kind of getting started. Um, you know, in the early days, we had a lot of a lot of bedroom projects like, oh, I just make beats or I just do this on the on the side and I just want to try it out and see if I can get some sats. We've had some stuff where it's like, oh, I used to make music 10 years ago. I'm going to upload all this stuff from, from, you know, my catalog from when I was a teenager or whatever. Um, and in some cases that's actually sort of in a, in a couple of cases, actually that's revived the revived careers of some people who sort of were musicians kind of gave up on it. And then they're like, actually, this mm-hmm. is really cool. I might, I might, you know, they gave up on it because they're like, this is a dead end street but then start earning money right out of the gate and, and getting excited about it, interacting with people and getting positive feedback right away. Um, Cause that's the other really important element of it is the, the connection with the listener. And, um, and yeah, so, I mean, you know, those types of people and then moving on to what, who I think is the ideal candidate today for somebody who would want to try it now is like someone who is either just getting started or, or has just gotten started in the last couple of years. And it's very, aware of how much money they do or do not make on traditional platforms. And then hopefully being pleasantly surprised after a couple months, we have a really good example of that. Uh, This girl, Ainsley Costello joined in July and I, I met her and her family at Bitcoin park at a, at a thing that was happening there. And I was just like, you know, just give it a shot. You don't have to, you don't have to take anything off of, off of Spotify, you know, just like throw a track up there. Like maybe, who knows, maybe in a week you'll have 10 bucks, you know, and she's, she's, um, still today, our biggest artist that we've ever had on there. She was the first artist that get over a million sats. I think she's up to, she's, I think she's earned just over 700 bucks in the last couple months and really cool metric there to compare that against is that in five years on 65 platforms, she's made $750 total with her entire catalog. So with four songs, she's almost made the same amount in the last two or three months. So, um, the potential is really there. And I think that's the cool part about it is the people, especially the people that are used to making like three or four bucks a month from streaming platforms. And then they come over and they're making 10, 20, 30, a hundred bucks. You know, it's like this, there's something here. And those people get really excited. And those people then go tell their peers and their friends and their family who maybe don't know much about it. And that's the best way to get them in the door. It's like they, they have someone who they trust who is sort of onboarding them through us instead of, a company being like, Hey, come over here and try this crazy idea, you know? And that's, that's just for like personal business, business experience. That's how I ran my, my other business where I work with, with bands is I never did any marketing or cold outreach at all. It was like, especially for the first 10 years, it was just all that stuff was coming in from referrals from other bands or people that had worked with me in the past. And that's built the strongest foundation for us. So yeah, instead of just trying to, there's a lot, I mean, there's some like, you know, shit coin music services out there and, with a lot of VC money and fancy, it's very, they're very flashy and they're convincing people that things are going to be different. But at the end of the day, you get there and you realize it's just like everything else. And then they ultimately end up, you know, pulling a rug on it and moving on to the next thing. Cause it's not generating the money that they, that they mm-hmm. thought it might. So that's why it's important to us to play the slow game and bring in those people that are going to have a good experience. You know, even if they're, even if they're only making a buck or two a month, it's still potentially more than they're going to make anywhere else. So it's, it's, it just shows the potential of where this could go is the most important part about it at this stage. So I feel like this has been a great intro for people who haven't known about Wavelake or who have maybe seen something on Twitter or somewhere else but haven't checked it out yet, as well as hopefully for musicians, even if you're like someone who has an idea of a single song, like if even if you're a one hit wonder, if that one hit is wonderful enough, you can make quite a, a decent chunk of change on Wavelake. So hopefully this will encourage some people to check it out either as musicians or or listeners. But before we finish up, Sam, do you have any final thoughts or places people can go to keep up with you? I guess wavelake.com is a great place to start, but uh, any final thoughts or directions you want to send people? Yeah, wavelake.com. You can find us on all the social stuff just at wavelake. Um, Yeah, I mean, I just would say, I mean, if you're a musician listening to this, if you have family or friends that are in in the music business at all, or just getting started, um, look into it. You know, it's like, give it a shot. That's all. That's what I tell everybody, it's like, just try it. Even if you don't know how this works, you don't really have to. That's, that's what we're ultimately looking to achieve is like, you don't, you shouldn't have to have all this technical knowledge of how this stuff works. I want people to just get on Mm. and just start earning money. You know, that's the way it, that's the way it should work. That's the exchange that should happen is you should artists and musicians should just be able to do what they love to do and be rewarded for it. If people find it 
valuable to them. So that's, you know, ultimately I think will work in the long run. And, and we're just trying to make that easy for people. So just give it a shot. And if you have feedback, please give it to us. Cause we learn, we're, like I said, we're learning from everybody every day. Excellent. Well, Sam, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Well, friends, it's a wrap. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Business Bitcoinization Show. By the way, Sam told me they are going to be able to restore that 100-year-old sign. Definitely check out Wavelake for yourself, but also get your favorite artists on there so you can support them. As always, keep building, keep growing, and until next time, keep living and leading well. If you're a regular listener of the podcast, thank you. If you want to take a further step in your support for the show, you can help us grow by listening on Fountain, a value for value podcast app on iOS or Android. If you hear something you like that you disagree with or anything else, you can share it by sending some sats and adding a comment with your thoughts. Some of you have already done this and I appreciate it. I'm going to begin reading your boosts on upcoming episodes. So if you have some insight or value to add, let the people know. Getting started with Fountain is easy. You can add Bitcoin to your Fountain wallet by using your fiat accounts or any lightning wallet and one of my favorite features is that once you're using the app you can earn sats just by listening on fountain check out the link in the show notes to get started with fountain today